The main issue uh, when it comes to domestic violence is a desire for power. Most people who have experienced harm um, or are experiencing harm um, often feel trapped. Isolation is very, very central to many people's experience of domestic violence. Welcome, Dr. Yasi. Thank you. Can you introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, hi, I'm Yasi Safinia Davies, um, and I'm a psychologist as well as um, I'm the executive director here at SAVE, which is a domestic violence agency for survivors. Mm -hmm. Top up. Okay, so welcome in. Mm -hmm. This is SAVE. When a person is looking for support here, mm -hmm. uh, this is where they come. We have all kinds of information and resources. Mm -hmm. um, individuals who experience domestic violence um, are often looking for um, certain kinds of services, mm -hmm. legal support and information about um, physical health, well-being, psychological well-being, mm -hmm. other kinds of organizations that may be able to provide additional services. Okay. And so we make sure to try and keep information fresh Mm -hmm. and also in many languages. Um, behind this door is where we hold our support groups mm -hmm. um, and that's a very special piece to the healing process is being able to find other individuals who've had a similar experience. So it's like a group of people mm -hmm. they talking about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all situation. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, and again, some people are still in, in their relationship. Some people have just left, and some people have been out of the relationship for a very long time. But as I said, the healing process is often ongoing. Um, and so anyone is welcome to come to the group and um, be present in whatever way they can be present. Okay. Um, Save the mission. Yeah, no. this is our mission statement. Um, so our mission is to strengthen every individual and family we serve with the knowledge and support needed to end the cycle of abuse and build healthier lives. So again, um, it goes back to our mission isn't to tell people what to do. Mm -hmm. Our mission is really to help people feel strong again and Empowered. help them feel re-empowered exactly yes. to, to find themselves again. What is domestic violence? Well, <clears throat> domestic violence is when relationship between two people either currently or formerly exists. Um, and in that relationship, there are forms of harm. It can be physical, psychological, it can be sexual. Um, there are all kinds of ways that people use power to harm another individual. And so domestic violence is specific to people who have an intimate partnership. Mm -hmm. So what the effect of domestic violence say, based on family or individual person? Well, um, some of the really big uh, challenges that people who are survivors experience, um, obviously there are many psychological challenges that people can experience. Um, mm -hmm. There's post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression. Um, some people may turn to using substances, alcohol and drugs. Um, 
there's also a high risk for poverty, mm -hmm. uh, especially if um, one partner is not allowing the other partner to become financially independent. Um, there are risks for mm, death, uh, rape. Mm -hmm. um, there, the risks also include um, children growing up in homes where um, they're observing violence. And in most homes where there's domestic violence, children are also being physically harmed. issue uh, when it comes to domestic violence is a desire for power, um, a desire to be in control. Mm -hmm. And um, the, it's really impossible to know who's most likely going to become someone who demands to be the person in charge. Um, and I don't mean um, someone who can make good decisions and someone who problem solves really well. I mean somebody who wants to have power at the expense of another person's personal choices and freedom. And, um, and so I would say that there are certainly behaviors and characteristics mm -hmm. um, that could give you a sign, mm -hmm. that give you indication mm -hmm. that this person might have difficulty um, being in intimate relationships and treating their partner you know, with respect and kindness and equally. So a lot of the things that you might see is somebody who uh, tends to manipulate, mm -hmm. someone who wants to make all your choices, someone who um, doesn't like to um, be undermined uh, or told uh, or disagreed with. Those are some pretty good indications that somebody um, is likely to use harm as mm -hmm. a way to um, dominate um, and feel that sense of control and power, especially if they feel chaotic. That's so weird. Stop! No! Stop! Fuck your eyes, you. Hold your motherfucking ass. Stop! Hold your motherfucking ass. I'm tired of your fucking shit. Get up! Get your motherfucking ass up in here. Stop. Fuck, man, you. I always in here fucking acting crazy. Don't want to wash my clothes and do the fucking dishes. You need to take me to the hospital. Out. Not take no hospital. You need to take me to the hospital. I'm not getting another head. motherfucking new bill to play. My what? hand, it hurts. You need to take me to the hospital. Fuck that hand. What's wrong with you? You used to love me. And you was wrong with me. All you do is hit me now. All I do is hit you. I don't yeah. fucking hit you. You made me fucking no, hit you. No, I don't. I'm, fucking, I'm talking Stop. to you. I'm fucking Stop. talking to you. Stop. Stop.
walk your past work right into the ground. For people who are not experienced domestic violence, they may mm -hmm. ask the victim, mm -hmm. why mm -hmm. don't you leave? It's a really complicated question. Um, and it's also, um, I think, really difficult for people to understand. Um, it's really easy to blame a victim because they're already down. Mm -hmm. They already... Um, uh, are low. It's very easy to keep beating up a person who's already very low. Yes. So again, the victim blaming that we do in our communities, um, we have shifted the responsibility of the person who's actually causing harm in a domestic violence relationship onto the person who's being harmed. That's what we've done in our communities. When we talk about domestic violence, we often only talk about the victims, and we very seldom really highlight the people who are actually making the problem exist. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. And, and then the second thing is um, there are so many reasons why people stay. There, there is an attachment. I think a lot of times yeah. people forget that you can still love someone who's harming you. Um, because in a lot of ways, all of us have at least one or two or three relationships in our lives with people who we love, but that person maybe is a little complicated, yes. or maybe they have behaviors that you sort of tolerate. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, that just becomes a different degree of what are you willing to tolerate. A lot of people who have survived domestic violence um, will come to us and they'll say, I love my partner. I just want this person to stop hurting me. Um, I still want to stay with this person, but I and I know that if this person just wouldn't do these couple of things, we could actually be fine. Um, and so that's really hard for people to understand that there's still an attachment a lot of times to the person you're, who's harming you. And then, especially for people where there are children involved yeah. and the partner has really, um, the person who's doing the harm has really stopped um, the person who's being harmed from financial independence, then the choice sometimes is, do I go and live in poverty and be homeless with my children Mm -hmm. Or do I stay here and at least my children have a roof over their ho head, at least they're eating, um, at least there's some security, um, even if it's going to be violent at times. So that's not really a choice, if you think about it. Um, the decision between being homeless or staying in a violent situation, that's not really a choice. And so a lot of people feel very stuck. Um, I mean, there's also the added piece of um, a lot of times people in violent situations, um, the person harming them has really isolated the victim. Um, you know, um, family may have turned away, friends may have turned away. If you don't have a job, you may not have um, coworkers and other kinds of peers you can reach out to for help. Mm -hmm. it, it can be very hard for family members of a victim to keep being supportive. Um, sometimes family members really start to get frustrated. Why don't you just leave? And I think, again, part of the reason it's easier to blame the victim is um, family members feel hopeless too, and they feel helpless. Um, you know, watching somebody else stay in a violent situation f makes you feel hopeless and helpless. Yeah. And so it's easier to say, why don't you just leave? Um, so it's very, very, very complicated. Um, so if you've become isolated, if all of the other people in your life have sort of turned their back away from you, where do you go? You stay attached to your partner. So it's, it's, it's not as easy as just walking away. Um, and on average, um, 
it takes about seven times for a person to leave, come back, leave, come back before they permanently leave. And for a lot of people, um, also there are cultural, cultural factors. Mm -hmm. What if I leave and now my children aren't growing up in our community? Mm -hmm. um, they don't have access to our cultural values, our cultural traditions. If I leave my partner, my community will kick us all out. Um, you know, so, so a lot of times um, victims are having to make decisions beyond themselves. They're also having to make decisions about their children's livelihood. It's very complex. It's not as simple as just deciding, I'm fed up, I'm out of here. Um, so, um, again, I think it's very easy to pinpoint the person being harmed. And very seldom do people flip the question around and say, why are you harming this person? Yeah. You say you love this person, why do you do harm? Um, so we have a lot to look at as a society about when we ask people the question, why don't you just leave? It's, um, it's, it's more complex than, a, than the simple answers and it's more complex than people often can realize. Hi. We got a call earlier of a disturbance at the college. And that was you and Danny. So what happened today? Um. Okay. You seem real reluctant to say anything because you have a fear of him. Is okay. that what's going on? Are you afraid of him? I love him. I know he's, he's a really good man. Okay, does a really good man beat you? He's, he's not a very good relationship person. Okay. So what were you doing when he assaulted you? You know, we've got a copy of the tape of your call, and it's fairly obvious that he's assaulting you pretty Can hard. Hear it? You need to tell me what's going on. See, the problem is right now you're trying to protect him. You've got blood on your clothes, you got blood on your knee. He has a bloody shirt. No, I have his bloody shirt, which is probably going to be your blood. Nobody deserves to get beaten. Nobody deserves to have somebody try to kill them. The girl down that lives below you is really concerned that he tried to kill you. And your neighbor said you had a very violent boyfriend, and that's Danny. And I know that he's had, it. I don't remember the girl's name, I can find it. She had a restraining order against him because their relationship was violent. Why do you feel sick? It's just nauseating. That's a pretty good, pretty good lump on the center of your forehead. You got a pretty nasty injury to the head. And you got to injure your knee, your hand. And to your, to your eye. Yeah. And it's obvious you're in pain. When you stand up, you groan. You've been holding your stomach. I'm going to tell you right now, we thought that he killed you somewhere, mm -hmm. and we seized his shirt as evidence in case you turned up dead. We met through family. He was a really, really nice person. My family knew his boss. And so do you think mm -hmm. the victim um, feel trapped in oh, the relationship? Oh, I'm, I'm, yes, most, most people who've experienced harm um, or are experiencing harm um, often feel trapped. You feel trapped in your decisions. Um, you feel trapped in, uh, you know, the fear of judgment from other people. Um, it, you may have very few um, ways to get help. Um, it's a very, very scary place to be, absolutely. Um, and especially, I think, if you... Um, when a person who's being harmed has ever talked to another person and if that person judged them or they felt that they weren't um, um, getting the kind of um, compassionate response, um, it can be very isolating. Isolation is very, very central to many people's experience of domestic violence. And in many ways, um, people who do harm are hoping for that isolation to happen because that allows them to have even more control. So they're really, they, it helps to make sure that the person you're harming feels isolated 
because then you can have more control and more power over that person. So it's very much, it's very central to the experience of domestic violence. In most situations when there are children, um, it is very hard to do anything else but tolerate the harm. And sometimes abusive people will also um, threaten to harm the children. Um, and so the, the children are used also as part of, of the manipulation and the way of trying to control. Or partners will say, if you leave, I'll take the children. Um, and yes. especially if the partner is the one who's financially more able to do that. Yeah. Um, so that's another reason why people often stay, is that if, the, if there are threats that I will take the children away, um, um, uh, oftentimes a person will continue to stay. It's really common, yeah. really, really yeah. common. You mean here? It's very common here. Um, and oftentimes people don't know in the United States that there are laws that will, should you, for example, choose to flee, um, choose to leave, and you take the children with you, um, there are laws that will help protect that decision at least until um, you go through a divorce if you're actually married. Um, and it, no matter what, you go through some kind of a family court process and the court fortunately will decide. But again, it's still very scary because um, if the person doing harm has more money, mm -hmm. sometimes they'll have better uh, legal representation. Um, yes. And so the outcome may be very painful for a person who's trying to leave a violent situation. So what possible solution for those victims? Mm -hmm. it just depend on themselves. Yeah, um, well, I would say finding community, um, finding spaces that understand your situation, a place like this. Yes, mm -hmm. really warm. Absolutely. I feel relaxed when I was here. Good, that's our yeah. goal. That's one yeah. of our core. It's like a family. Yeah, that's what we hope for. We hope that when people yeah. arrive here, they feel like they've come uh, home, in mm. a sense, you know, that it's you've come home. somewhere that understands. Home. Yeah. It is like a home, though. Mm. You can have everything, and it. it's really like a home, you know. Mm -hmm. Every everyone supports you, mm -hmm. and you feel like yourself, right? Real self, not just right. Nobody talk, talk to you. Or something. Exactly, exactly. What What do you <clears throat> like when you're not in, living in fear, right? Yeah, this is our family therapy room that I was mentioning. Mm -hmm. So sometimes. Um, some relationship building needs to happen between the parent who's been harmed and the children. Um, and, um, and also, um, this is a great space to use when you have um, maybe two kids who, mm -hmm. as yes. siblings, are engaging yes. in therapy. Um, and so, um, again, it's really important for spaces to feel inviting and to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, there's also something that we really value, which is that our spaces have dignity. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so we really want to make sure that um, the, the furniture, the, the art, the space itself doesn't feel dirty or uh, run down. Um, we really think that everyone deserves um, dignified spaces in order to heal. 
And so that's important to us. That's a, that's a big value. Yes. I'll show you. Um, we also have a plate. So this is um, the children's therapy room, mm -hmm. a big part of the healing process for children and also a way wow. for um, psychotherapists to understand how a small child is coping with their life experience is to see how are they playing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why it's really important for therapy rooms for small children to have ways for them to express themselves through play. We have no um, restriction on what your age is. If you have had your life impacted in some way by domestic violence, you're welcome here. So, um, you know, to us, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how old you are. If you're being impacted by domestic violence, you deserve to get some support. So we have people of all ages here. So the, 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 I mean, the small children, they just come here to play. And, mm -hmm. and then the therapists will um, see, how they play. see how they're playing, um, help them talk about their feelings. A lot of times it's with small children, it's helping them understand how they feel. Um, it's help. It's very helpful for the psychotherapist to understand. Remember the fairy tales. Mm -hmm. You know, if yeah. a child has created a fairy tale about what's happening in their life, the job of the psychotherapist is to understand what is this fairy tale that you've created, and um, then oftentimes to then work with the parent and say, um, you know, this is this is how your child has been perceiving their experience. Um, with an older child, maybe a 10-year-old all the way up to a 17-year-old, um, you can really talk with them. Mm -hmm, you, you can yeah. actually engage in some pretty effective talk mm -hmm, therapy yes. um, and, you know, explore with them what are the feelings that you have about the situation that mm -hmm. you're in. The other thing to remember is people don't just talk about the domestic violence. There's, they talk about all kinds of other things too, right? And especially for children, they're mostly going to talk about their relationships at school. And so um, it's important to look at how are they describing their relationships at school when you think about the fact that they're living in a violent home. And so looking at that and um, helping them think about um, when someone at school frustrates you, how are you going to respond, you know, and really trying to um, stop that intergenerational domestic violence mm -hmm. from happening. So yes. it's important to do the work yeah. for anyone who's being touched by domestic violence. It's important to help the primary person being harmed, but it's also important to help the people who are living right there We met through family. He was a really, really nice person. My family knew his boss and on his recommendation, my parents proceeded. Yeah, he was the most charming person ever. Everyone loved him. Nobody had a bad word to say about him.